Great, thanks David, and I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to present today. So I'm going to take the side of uh, using involved field radiotherapy uh, at the end of uh, chemotherapy for patients who remain PET positive. So I thought I'd first spend uh, just a moment to review the Doville score, as we just um, saw in the, the survey. I think most of you have familiarity with this, but I think it's important to, uh, when evaluating the data, to keep in mind what the Doville score is. So no uptake is a one. Um, two is less than or equal to the mediastinum. Three is greater than mediastinum, but less than or equal to liver. Four is moderately increased compared to liver, and five uh, is markedly increased, or new areas of FDG avidity. So what is the data that we have to support using RT alone in patients with PET positivity at the end of chemotherapy? And obviously, there are no randomized studies to answer this question, so um, my argument is going to be using some, a number of different strategies to try to convince you that this is a good strategy. So this was a study um, that was done uh, at our center a, a number of years ago in looking at patients who were a retrospective analysis of 73 patients who remained um, PET positive uh, at the end of, or evaluating uh, PET at the end of uh, chemotherapy, and all of these patients uh, received radiation. There were 73 patients uh, included, and as you can see, the majority of the patients in this retrospective analysis had early stage disease, 89% and the majority of patients receive standard ABBD chemotherapy, most for four to six cycles of chemotherapy. So in looking at um, the patients who were PET positive at the end, 16% um, of patients were PET positive, and in this study, this predated the Doville scores, um, so this was um, similar to what would be considered a Doville 2. And for patients who then went on to receive involved field radiotherapy in this group of patients who were PET positive, 69% of those patients remained without evidence of progression. 3% three, uh, 3 of patients relapsed. And if you look at the curves here, you can see that nearly 70% of patients uh, in this retrospective series who remained PET positive at the end of treatment did well with radiation alone. So then there's some data from British Columbia. This is also from their very large database um, of patients who are all treated in a uniform fashion. So uh, Carrie Savage presented this at uh, ASH uh, recently. Patients um, there, after completing chemotherapy, um, who have a residual mass by CT that's at least two centimeters, then undergo a PET CT scan. They're not able to get PETs on all of the patients due to resources. Those who are end of uh, treatment PET negative are observed, and those who are PET positive go on to get involved field radiotherapy to 30 to 35 gray. So in uh, her analysis here, the overall group using this strategy of bulky patients had a five-year freedom from treatment failure of 86%. And when you look at this, um, according to PET negative and PET positive, there were 79 PET negative patients who did extremely well with bulky disease without radiation um, at 90%. Those patients who were PET positive, again, about 20%, um, so similar to the previous retrospective analysis, 68% of those patients did well with radiotherapy alone. So this is very consistent with the, the data that we had from uh, Dana-Farber. I think the RAPID study also um, lends credence to this argument. So just to uh, refresh your memory, this was a study from Europe, patients with stage 1 and 2A uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma without B symptoms were treated with three cycles of ABVD and then underwent a PET scan. Patients who were PET negative were then randomized to receive involved field radiotherapy versus no further therapy. Those who were PET positive uh, went on to receive an additional cycle of ABVD followed by radiation. Um, in this study, importantly, uh, a negative PET was considered Doville 1 or 2. So um, I want to focus in here not on the patients who were PET negative, but the patients who were PET positive. And as you can see, um, about 25% of patients were PET positive. And um, 
the progression-free survival uh, was 86%. So really, again, quite good. You could argue that um, because Deauville 3 patients uh, were considered to be PET positive, there may be a favorable group there who may have actually been in remission at the end of treatment. But that still leaves a substantial number of patients who were PET 4 or 5 uh, Deauville scores who did quite well. So I would argue that um, this study also suggests that radiotherapy may be an effective modality in patients who are chemotherapy uh, resistant. So this study um, instead addresses patients who have advanced stage disease. Um, this is the HD10 study, I mean, sorry, HD15 study from the Germans where um, patients were randomly assigned to receive six or eight cycles of escalated BACOP or BACOP14. At the end of therapy, patients underwent CT uh, restaging. Those who had a mass greater than uh, two and a half centimeters were then um, sent to have a PET scan. Patients who were PET negative were observed. Patients who were PET positive then received radiotherapy. And if you look in these curves here, you can see these are the patients who were um, PET negative. These are the PET positive patients who received radiotherapy, and really they did quite well, better than uh, I would have expected with very good long-term control of disease. So I think um, this data, again, supports that you may be able to salvage patients. You could argue, well, this is BACOP and not ABVD. That may account for some differences. But I still think it, it adds credence to um, this argument. So is there any way that we could predict which of those patients um, are likely to fail with radiotherapy only? And this was an analysis of that study done. Uh, later looking at could they use it CT volumetric analysis of the residual disease um, to assess whether someone would do well with radiation alone. And what they found here was um, the lower risk or higher risk were considered, did they have a partial remission by 50% uh, shrinkage of disease? But they found if they used a cutoff of greater than or equal to 40% shrinkage, those were the patients who did quite well. And you could identify a population of patients here who were PET positive at the end and had less than a 40% reduction in tumor volume who were more likely to go on to recur. So that's the pro. What, what about the data to support autologous stem cell transplant in Hodgkin lymphoma? Well, the data, the randomized data, is actually quite thin. Um, this was the first study uh, supporting uh, the use of high-dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant in, uh, published in The Lancet in 1993. And in this study, patients were randomized to uh, beam uh, transplant or mini beam. And as you can see, this is a very small study. There are only 20 patients in each arm. Um, at the time this study was opened, um, it was very difficult to accrue patients because it was a, on the part of uh, uh, treating physicians a foregone conclusion that autologous transplant was the optimal way to manage these patients. So um, if you look here at the um, progression-free and overall survival. This study did demonstrate a difference in progression-free survival. However, there was no difference in overall survival. This is not statistically significant. There was a second randomized study published um, a few years later um, using a similar strategy where patients um, were randomized to receive dexabeam uh, with or without autologous stem cell transplant. Those who did not get transplant got additional cycles of dexabeam. Um, this was the patient population, and you can see, again, this is really a very small study with 56 patients in one arm and 61 patients in the other arm. A lot of these patients initially had early stage disease. And when you look at the cause of death here, there were more deaths in the, um, in the chemotherapy only arm. There were, interestingly, more early toxic deaths in the, uh, the dexabeam arm uh, with more late toxicities in the transplant arm. And again, there was a difference in freedom from treatment failure, but no difference in overall survival. This was also a meta-analysis looking at the overall survival data for patients uh, with uh, relapsed Hodgkin's. And you can see here, um, these all hit one, so there was no survival benefit uh, in combining these studies. 
The other thing I'd like to point out, there are a lot of phase two um, studies looking at uh, the use of autologous stem cell transplant in patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma. But many of these patients also receive radiotherapy, which makes it a little bit difficult to understand what the contribution of the transplant is. So this is a representative study from Memorial from 2010, and you can see 153 patients were treated here, and 75% of the patients received radiotherapy as part of their treatment. This was the study, uh, one of the studies published from Memorial showing the really important um, uh, role of pre-transplant PET in predicting who was going to stay in remission. So what are the downsides of taking a young patient uh, to, or any patient, to autologous stem cell transplant? We know there is a risk of treatment-related MDS or AML, secondary solid tumors, infertility, cardiac disease, pulmonary disease and infection. We know, uh, based on a number of studies, that patients are at risk for um, dying of second uh, malignancies after transplant, as well as developing cardiovascular disease. There are many such graphs that you've probably seen, and this is the, the deaths from Hodgkin's, which occur early, whereas those from other causes start to rise the further you get out from uh, stem cell transplantation. And in this study, they also evaluated um, what was the absolute excess risk of developing a secondary malignancy. And uh, you can see, compared to baseline, significantly, significantly elevated here. Um, when compared to patients um, who had Hodgkin's and did not undergo stem cell transplant, it was still really quite elevated. So I think um, this debate is going to change moving forward, given uh, the availability of novel treatment paradigms. As you all know, brentuximab adotin, the antibody drug conjugate targeting CD30, is a very active drug in the relapse and refractory setting with an overall response rate of 75% with 33% complete remissions. We now know there may be additional mechanisms of action um, uh, in addition to de delivering the MMAE microtubule inhibitor uh, into the Reed-Sternberg cell. Recent data has also um, supported the biologic basis of targeting uh, PD-1 in Hodgkin lymphoma, and um, there have been a number of recent studies showing that um, there is near uniform amplification of 9P24 in within the Reed-Sternberg cells, and this 9P24 encodes for PDL1 and PDL2. There have been several recent um, publications demonstrating really the significant efficacy of both nivolumab and pembrolizumab in this disease with overall response rates of 65%. And this just let's see here, illustrates, oops, sorry, go back for one second. Here, um, here's just that graphically uh, shown here, the PDL1 expression on the Reed Sternberg cells and the copy gain uh, and amplification of 9P24. So in summary, I would argue that a significant number of patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma who remain PET positive at the completion of chemotherapy may experience long-term disease control with radiotherapy alone. Many patients with localized disease who undergo autologous stem cell transplant um, also receive radiotherapy as part of their um, salvage, and that may also contribute to outcomes. We know that autologous stem cell transplant is associated with long-term risks, including secondary malignancies. And we know there is no overall survival benefit to transplant, which I would argue you should reserve for patients um, who have subsequent progression after radiotherapy. And I think um, novel agents are really going to change the way we manage both upfront and relapse disease. And hopefully, we'll see some trials trying to answer this question. Could we potentially combine um, checkpoint inhibitors with radiotherapy or other approaches in patients in this situation? And I think we still need some randomized trials to really demonstrate um, an overall survival benefit for autologous transplant. Thank you.